Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sanjana. I'm one of the founders of Miara. I'll just share one slide with all of you to tell you what we do here at Miara. Um, one second. Yep. So Miara is a science and evidence-backed platform for women in menopause transition and beyond. Started by two scientists, Gayatri and me. Gayatri is also on the call today. And uh, some of the services we provide are information and awareness. Uh, for example, this webinar here today through our social media blogs and interviews. We also offer personalized health and wellness solutions and uh, provide corporate sensitization and awareness sessions. You can follow us um, in the links that provided. And this month is Menopause Awareness Month. And we've had a few events and we're very excited about this particular event because uh, the month's focus is uh, on cardiovascular disease. So that's why we're very happy to have Dr. Sharon with us today. She is a staff cardiologist at McKinsey Health and an adjunct assistant professor at the Division of Cardiology Department of Medicine at University of Toronto. She studied, uh, she has a bachelor's degree and also has uh, RCPSC in internal medicine, cardiology, and also a fellowship in echocardiography. Uh, uh, what is very interesting is she's involved in community health promotion in vulnerable communities in the greater Toronto area and is a spokesperson of the Heart and Stroke uh, Foundation related to uh, women's health and awareness. So we are extremely, extremely happy to have her with us so that and, you know, you know, get her to answer some of our most um, uh, important questions regarding heart health and menopause. So over to you, Dr. Sharon, I'll just stop sharing quickly and uh, kind of put you on spotlight. So I'll just unpin my remote pin so you can share your slides now. You're on mute, by the way. Hi, yeah. everyone. Nice to see you. So I'm going to share screen, share screen, desktop and slideshow. All right, we're good. So thank you again to this platform provided by Miara. And as you may know, the grounding quote from this organization is that of Michelle Obama's. Uh, that communities and countries and ultimately the world are only as strong as the health of their women. And people here on this call are from Switzerland, India, Canada, everywhere in between. And the fact that you are here uh, is a big deal because you've clearly invested this time in yourself. And it would be really important if even you can take this message you hear today out to just one person or more than one person you care about. And this is really how change happens. And what we're gonna talk about now is to raise awareness of sex-specific differences in heart disease. The objectives are very much in sync with the mission of Miara, which is empowering women with the awareness to make informed decisions and be in control of their own health. I wanna paraphrase Dr. Erin Mikos, who's at Hopkins, and she said, how we live the first half of our lives really influences our freedom from getting sick in the second half of our lives. And I do know that this talk is supposed to be focused on menopause, but what happens after menopause is really affected by what happens before menopause. And so we're gonna talk about that and understand what you can do uh, where you are in your life journey to help uh, take charge of your heart health. So when we think about menopause, this is a big club of people. 6,000 women in the US go through this, 2 million women a year, and just multiply that by the global population. And these are some views of menopause in pop culture. And while there are some things to look forward to, it's also a major change for the body and the brain and the heart. Now, when we talk about heart disease, we mean coronary artery disease. And that really starts in utero. This here is the earliest documentation of human heart disease. They did CAT scans on ancient Egyptian mummies that were over 2000 years old. And we believe that there is a really strong gene environment interplay that begins early in postnatal life after you're born and is progressive in all human populations. 
And because this is a global talk, it's worth pointing out that this is a global disease. Universally, heart disease is the number one cause of death amongst women, accounting for a third of all deaths around the world. Typically, this is an epidemic of wealthy developed countries, but we're increasingly seeing it present in poorer developing countries. This is largely because of adverse diet, poorer lifestyle, environmental risk factors. When we talk about the South Asian diaspora, which is of interest within the Miara community, people of South Asian descent are at the highest risk in the world from early heart disease. We have a couple of very large studies which are just coming to fruition. One is called the Masala study, founded in, uh, it's a collaboration between the University of San Francisco and Northwestern in Chicago, uh, looking at South Asians that have come to the US, a longitudinal study saying, what are the factors that lead to heart disease to guide prevention and treatment? And same thing with the UK Biobank, and both of them found that South Asians or people of South Asian ethnicity have an increased risk of abdominal obesity, abnormal cholesterol, more prediabetes and more diabetes. And these factors are strongly associated with coronary artery disease. So what do we mean when we talk about coronary artery disease? Well, how does heart disease develop? The blood supply for the heart muscle is called an artery. There are three big arteries and there are branches. And over time, cholesterol, particularly the bad kind of cholesterol called LDL or ApoB, will build up inside these arteries. And in the most typical or male pattern, studied in most literature and research, can burst. And your cholesterol is in part affected by diet, but it is mostly about 8, 75, 80% determined by your liver or genetics. And when people have a heart attack, the most common symptom, which is typical in both men and women, is chest discomfort. However, women are more likely to describe their symptoms differently. They may describe their words like, they may use words like crushing or squeezing, tightness or pressure. They may have shortness of breath or nausea or vomiting, back or jaw pain, fatigue. And if a patient is not likely to identify this as heart disease, or those who are treating them may not identify this as heart disease, this may affect their access to rapid life-saving treatment. I think it's also worth noting that younger women, less than 45 years of age, and older patients, both men and women, are more likely to have no chest pain, and they can have worse death because of this. Now, when we talk about risk factors, we know that 90% of heart attack risk is preventable when accounting for what we call modifiable risk factors. That was a global study out of McMaster and Hamilton in Canada, patients who had their first heart attack all around the world. And these are nothing new. I mean, we, we say no to tobacco, we get moving, we eat a balanced diet and have a healthy weight, and on the medical side, manage blood pressure, manage your cholesterol, manage your blood sugars. Adopting these behaviors, it should be noted, can be more easy for others, or for some rather than others, and that's because of equity and access issues. Is it safe? Do people have the means to do this? We know in Canada that nine out of 10 Canadians have at least one of these risk factors for heart and stroke. And in women, some of these can have a greater heart risk compared with men of the same age, and that's smoking and diabetes and high blood pressure. I've added stress here, that's the little head here. It's not included because I think of all the lifestyle factors, it gets the least amount of attention may have the greatest impact because there really is a mind, body and heart connection. We know that depression incidence is significantly higher in women than men, about two times higher. And depression does increase a women's heart attack risk by 50% both directly, and that's by the adrenaline symptoms, uh, the heart rate, blood pressure, your cortisol, insulin resistance, fat deposition, inflammation, but also indirectly. Women may have poor coping strategies leading to alcohol or smoking. They may become less active. They may not be as interested in seeing their physicians. And when we talk about these preventable risk factors, we have these risk calculators that help us assess people's overall risk. But we're not really concerned about a 10-year risk. I feel that if you're younger, it's never too late, the earlier, the better. We should be looking at a 40-year risk or a 50-year risk. 
And that's why I think it's very inspiring that many of you are on this call because you are interested in taking charge of your health. And so when we look at trends, this is an epidemiologic study of how heart disease death has decreased over the years. And in the 1980s, there was a significant decrease because of new medications to reduce cholesterol largely and treatment of blood pressure and smoking cessation. But you can see that up to year 2000, heart disease in women was actually rising and this came to medical attention. And it became a really hot topic in research that women are not small men. They have unique physiology, unique risk factors, unique responses to treatments. And this stimulated women's specific research. Before 1992, two thirds of the research was done in men. And any woman that was potentially pregnant in a reproductive age bracket, and that is a huge age span, were eliminated from any research because of the potential effects on pregnancy and fetuses. And as a result, we did not have that information. You can see the precipitous drop in heart disease death from women with the dawn of these sex-specific analyses and treatment and research. But what is concerning is in the more recent years, you can see that there's an uptick in death. We believe this may be due to the epidemics of diabetes, obesity, and metabolic disease. And we know that women with diabetes, for example, have a 50% increased risk compared to men with diabetes of having a heart event, largely because they get diabetes at an earlier age. But what is of concern is the fastest growing heart disease death risk group is younger women in the age of 45 to 64. And right now that's set to outpace some of the gains we've made in cancer deaths. And it's very discouraging because there are so very many tools for prevention. And we're gonna talk a little about, about this, but this is actually something of great relevance right now in cardiology at this time. Now, just to highlight this, this is a recent study out of Boston. They looked at a large group of patients who had had their first heart attack at or before 50 years at Harvard hospitals. And after a heart attack, women in red are at significantly increased risk of death compared to men after their events. And they're trying to try and understand why. This may be due to baseline differences in their risk factors and treatments, but possibly due to an inherent excess risk in young women after a heart attack. And this is what we're trying to understand. I feel like that was kind of him, wasn't it? Sorry, I'm gonna mute you here, sorry. All right. Now, when we talk about the Heart and Stroke Foundation in Canada, I had had a conversation briefly with someone on this call before we started this talk, that we do have some good tools and research that are going on in Canada and the US to try to help understand why heart disease in women is the way it is. And we, they came up with the concept of the unders. So in Canada, they've decided that um, they were characterizing it as under research, under diagnosed and under treated. We talked about the fact that two thirds of the research in men was done in men, women were underrepresented, there was a research gap and going forward, they're trying to look at more data specific analyses and address this through funding. We know that women have differences in biology, symptoms and response to treatment. They're less likely to receive timely revascularization and CPR. And that male pattern disease that we saw in the video earlier is well recognized. And if women have that type of heart attack, sure, our diagnostic tools and treatments are very good for that. But the female pattern of coronary disease, which can affect more women than men, our treatment and diagnostics may not be as good. And so we need to have better tools to be able to look into this. And lastly, this is an awareness issue. So we know both in Canada and the US, there are major gaps in women knowing that heart disease is a leading cause of death. Many perceive that breast cancer is something that they are more at risk for. And what's interesting is that uh, younger women who could have done more for primordial prevention if it was begun sooner, this is a group that we can look at as well as ethnic groups and visible minorities who may not necessarily have health literacy or understand this. I put this slide in just to highlight the many roles we as women are used to playing as mothers, sisters, as caregivers. And it's important to remember that in order to keep taking care of others, 
we have to keep taking care of ourselves. And this led to some increasing research now in the cardiovascular risk spectrum over the arc of a woman's life. I know we're interested in menopause, but menopause is not a light switch that gets turned on or off. And it's important to understand the context, what comes before and how things change over time, and the conditions that lead to how heart disease arises. This is a graph of the age of first heart attack for Canadian men and women, men in blue, women in red. You can see that age is the biggest driver of risk. It goes up over time, more men than women. But there's a spike post-menopause. Conventionally, we have largely believed that there is an approximately 10-year gap between men and women, which is largely due to menopause. The average age of menopause is 51. But we'll talk about this in about another slide or two, that there are several groups in which this is absolutely not true. And this can lead to undertreatment and consequences. And while fewer of all people that will experience a major adverse heart event in their life, one third of women who experience a heart event will do so under the age of 65. And it's these women here. And so let's start with puberty. So in puberty, estrogen is the predominant estrogen in women of reproductive age. It has beneficial effects. They call it heart hormone and adipokine cardiometabolic imprinting. And basically, estradiol's effects can lower your bad cholesterol, your LDL, and is associated with a degree of cardiovascular protection. Puberty begins in the brain, triggers the hypothalamus to uh, release a signaling hormone to the pituitary, which goes to the ovaries, a surge in estrogen, and ovulation. And we know that lipids can shift over the course of a menstrual cycle. We also know that that's not clinically relevant. It's just an observation that we have. What's interesting is that when they looked at a study of women who were um, receiving cardiac testing for what we call ischemia, they found that the age by which they hit their period or menarche was associated in a J-shaped fashion with heart risk. So you can see that if you have menopause at 10 or, sorry, menarche at 10 or younger, or 14 or 15 and older, your risk of a heart event in your life, that's death, heart attack, stroke, heart failure, is higher. That's important to note that your age that you have, your period, is affected by your socioeconomic status, genetic factors, your environment, your body mass index, so it's very important to think about your healthy lifestyle starting in childhood. Then we get to the reproductive years. And we know that pregnancy is what we call a metabolic stress test. It really requires a lot out of you and many, many changes occur. And what happens at a cellular level is that estriol or E3 increases gradually in pregnancy and it peaks. And why is this? Well, it provides for the accumulation of maternal fat stores, which are very important for the mother and the fetus late in pregnancy. It's necessary for lactation, for vascularization of the placenta, synthesis of steroids necessary for lungs and that kind of thing. And generally, this is not a big deal unless you have a familial issue with cholesterols, in which case you should see your doctor before. We have an increasing awareness, though, of something called adverse pregnancy outcomes. I use that term here and preeclampsia. And we know that 10 to 20 percent of women have these events can be preterm delivery, children of small gestational age, preeclampsia. And we think that there's something about the abnormal response to pregnancy that causes inflammatory and oxidative stress and sets the stage for vascular damage, which can increase a woman's long-term risk well after delivery for the rest of their life. We know that if you've had a preterm birth, you can have an increased risk of mortality and an increased risk of developing high blood pressure, diabetes, dyslipidemia in that 10 years after pregnancy. If you have gestational diabetes, you have an eight times likelihood chance of developing diabetes later in life. And we know that this is why, if we can help optimize women's cardiometabolic health before and between pregnancies in this important time period, there may be a chance for a difference. 
I put this period point up here about multi-parity if you've had four or five children, simply because many patients tend to be in poor metabolic health later in life. And women, also men, can gain weight in each pregnancy. And this also sets the stage for cardiometabolic disease later. So we want to prevent long-term complications. Just coming back to this 10-year gap idea, say you're an ovulating 40-year-old woman who's still having periods, are you metabolically equivalent to a 30-year-old man? And the answer is, generally speaking, yes, but we treat individuals. And the exceptions to this are women with genetic conditions such as familial hypercholesterolemia, summarized as FH. Also, if you have a high LDL or something called lipoprotein A, which is higher in the South Asian and Black populations, family history of early disease and diabetes. Now, talking about FH, because this is actually a, a very high risk situation for women who may not know they have it, it's present in about one in 250 people in the population, affecting both women equally as men. And they have a 20 fold increase in the risk of heart events. And often they're undertreated because many patients may self perceive, or practitioners may self perceive, that the onset of atherosclerotic heart disease is 20 to 30 years later, but it happens 20 to 30 years earlier in women with this condition because of their unchecked atherosclerosis. You can see the trajectory. So 30% of women with untreated fam uh, familial hypercholesterolemia will have a heart attack at a very young age, less than 60. It's not so much the magnitude, the number of how bad your bad cholesterol is, it's the duration of exposure. And so we have great evidence that if we can drop cholesterol levels by in Canadian or SI units, one millimole per liter, each drop of one in your bad cholesterol is associated with a 15% decrease in prevention if you haven't had a heart event or 22% if you have. And we use things called statins, which are the cornerstone of management, which are equally effective in lowering heart attack risk in men and women. And we can, as you see it here, bend the curve so you can switch from being red or orange to someone who has better control of their cholesterol and may not ever have a heart event over their lifetime. And we know that there's genetic in, um, medications and genetic testing that we can test for children to see if they carry these. This is also very important in the prevention realm. Now, when we talk about menopause, this is very important. And the American Heart Association came out with a very definitive statement in 2020, which is highly informative. The last statement before that had been in 2011. Menopause is tricky because you don't know it's happened until it's happened. The definition is that it's not, you haven't had a period for about 12 months. And we know that women who have had premature menopause, less than 40, which is about 10% of women, it's a risk enhancer for heart disease because of their earlier cardiometabolic changes that we've talked about earlier. After menopause, decreased estrogen is made. The ovaries are still functioning. They're just doing different things. The circulating estrone, the weakest estrogen, is converted in the adrenals and the fat. And physiologic changes happen secondary to the withdrawal of estrogen. There's more visceral abdominal fat, more insulin resistance, lipids change quite dramatically within a relatively brief span of time. And this generally causes things like glucose intolerance, increased high blood pressure, endothelial dysfunction, which can increase cardiovascular risk. And this brings us to the last slide about hormone replacement therapy. Now, vasomotor symptoms, and that's hot flashes and lack of sleep and things like that are more common in menopause in about 80% of women in midlife. And women can be very symptomatic from these vasomotor symptoms, which can be disabling, if persistent, can also be associated with increased heart risk. We don't have data on trials in perimenopause. In the old days, it was thought maybe giving back women's at hor uh, men hormones at menopause would decrease their heart risk. And this is before the age of statins and other pillars of prevention, which we've talked about before. Um, in addition, they gave higher estrogen. It was called uh, conjugated equine estrogen. We have much better options now. In the, this caused hormone replacement therapy to sort of fall out of vogue because they studied women in the larger studies 
uh, at an older age in their menopause transition around age 63. And they found that the risk may have been harmful. There was no gain in cardiovascular benefit, but there was increased stroke and blood clots. And so it fell out of favor. When we look at why hormone therapy may be helpful, it can dilate blood vessels through something called a nitric oxic effect, and that can decrease hypertension. But they can also be prothrombotic, cause clotting, increase your lipids, increase your inflammation. Our more recent data on how we use hormone replacement therapy, it's reasonable to consider in women less than 60, and remember the average woman goes through menopause around 51 or within 10 years of menopause with symptoms. And this is very helpful because in women who may have significant symptoms, we can actually do this safely. However, it is advised in some places in the US, for example, they have clinics where they talk about your perimenopause risk, postmenopause risk and hormone replacement risk. And they look at your age, your menopause age, the length of hormone replacement you're using, the type, if it's not systemically absorbed, for example, topical estrogen, good for genitourinary symptoms, and trying to avoid it in patients who have uh, previous established heart disease and using the ones that are not systemically uh, absorbed. So it actually is very, very important to look at, and you know, women in their 30s for whom menopause is not even on their radar, if you're as healthy as possible going into menopause and you can do as much preventative work as possible, because if for no other reason, then it gives you more options at menopause. That's sort of the gist of, of how we approach this. Now there's some really excellent resources that can be looked into if you're interested in learning more about this. One is Peter Attia, who has a podcast on longevity medicine called Drive. And he interviewed Dr. Aaron Mikos, who does preventive health at Hopkins, as well as Dr. Joanne Manson from Harvard, who is the principal investigator of the Women's Health Initiative at Harvard that talked about hormone replacement therapy and the perspective over the years. The Heart and Stroke Foundation in Canada has a podcast called The Beat, which talks about women's lived experiences with heart events, uh, and the HeartWise podcast by the University of Ottawa Heart Institute in Canada. And then I just wanted to highlight the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women website, the Heart and Stroke Foundation's website on women. And there's these are really excellent resources if you're interested in learning more about women and heart disease. Lastly, menopause doesn't have to be anything to fear. It's a change, it's reproductive aging. And this is a musical, for example, there's actually a musical called Menopause the Musical. It's something that everyone or a good number of the population, 50% is gonna go through. And I think this is a really wonderful forum for us to be able to speak to this. And I wanted to thank Miara for the opportunity to do so. Thanks again. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that talk. I'm just gonna find myself uh if you can just, just stop sharing the slide oh, sure. no problem one second oh, sure Done. yeah that's then i'll just pin myself as well yeah so fantastic thank you for that really a nice talk and also just showing us the trends over the years that's uh, that was really good to know uh there have there were some questions on the chat maybe we'll start with those but if um yeah, so we'll just start with that and then we'll go on from there. So one of the questions was, what are some of the markers or preventative tests for looking at cardiovascular health? All right, I'm not muted so I can talk. Yeah. Um, all right, markers for cardiovascular health. So when you go see a cardiologist to talk about heart risk, which is a very common question that people ask, they often use something called a 10-year risk score. It was developed largely, the Framingham study was a study looking at people from 1950 to about the 2000s, may still actually be ongoing in America. This what women were underrepresented, it was largely a white population. This is where our understanding that obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol came about. But there are several conditions that are not reflected in that risk score, which are called risk amplifiers. And there is a move afoot to try to incorporate that better. 
The Framingham or 10-year pooled cohort equation is an excellent place to start, but you don't hear about early menopause or early menarche reflected. You don't see genetic factors or ethnicity reflected. You don't see autoimmune diseases such as lupus rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis reflected. And so polycystic ovarian syndrome is also another big one. So these risk calculators, there are a few that have tried to look at women's specific risk factors. There's one called the Reynolds risk score that happened in Boston. I think the reality is no calculator is gonna encompass everything. It's very important for people to understand their risks, to be in the best health they can be, see their doctor, and try to understand the things that uh, put them at increased risk. And this, you know, the Canadian guidelines have tried to incorporate this more recently in their iteration in 2021 by including ethnicity and in screening, including South Asian ethnicity, which was interesting. And every single person in Canada is allowed to have a funded lipoprotein A and ApoB assessment as a genetic cholesterol. But a lot of this has to do with, it starts with awareness and, and taking the empowerment of, of going and being motivated and talking to a practitioner. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of bloods, like what can you do in, yeah, you said ApoB, you said, and you mentioned cholesterol to look at that, um, you know, frequently and of course your genetic risk PCOS risk so I think there are multiple factors that kind of you know you can look at and you know that you are uh, you know likely to have a cardiac event and help prevent it early so I think you did uh, um, answer that question um, one of the questions was the protective role of estrogens I mean the thing is menopause is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease but it's not the only factor and i think that i i would like you to you know speak on that for a for a moment sure so estrogen comes from a different a few different sources right there's endogenous estrogen and all of the clinical studies we have of estrogen we do some bench work and we can see that in mouse models, for example, higher estrogen can lead to decreased bad cholesterols and things like that. So I did touch on that, I think, mm -hmm. about how estrogen can lower bad cholesterol, cause cardiovascular protection. It's interesting when we talk about things like oral contraceptive pills, right? That's exogenous estrogen. And, and we know there's various types of them. Um, we can see that synthetic estrogen can lead to a rise in blood pressure and an increased cardiovascular risk. Estrogen can actually increase your triglycerides. Um, we know that with newer formulations of oral contraceptive pills, that there is less estrogen, so you may not have so much of these deleterious effects. Um, transdermal estrogens are less likely to cause these rises in triglycerides. Um, we know that women who have cardiovascular conditions, they can have things like IUDs or whatever, which do not have circulating estrogen. So I think estrogen as a protective hormone is an association, right? It may not necessarily be a causation in that you take it to prevent, but yeah. we do know that it is associated with decreased heart risk. And that there is a very steep rise after menopause. And this is why a lot of the research has now been going into that perimenopausal transition. And it is also relevant noting that the pattern of going into menopause is not uniform. So some people may have a rise in estrogen before it drops precipitously. Mm -hmm. Some people may have a flat decrease. And so there, there are a number of different profiles biochemically and how your FSH and your estrogen are as they are decreasing that differentially affected. Um, but estrogen not is a protective hormone, but not in the sense that you take it to get better. It's just associated with that lower risk time in your life in general. Okay. And we also need more research on perimenopausal women. So that's 100%. definitely, yeah. I was interested in knowing that because a lot of people that I know are going through these things and yes. perimenopause can last, you know, 10 years. So that's a long time. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions was um, heart palpitations are perimenopause symptoms as well. How do we know that it's a cardiac issue versus a hormonal issue? I think that's the, yeah. 
Good question. Very good question. I get a lot of consults about these. And one of the challenges is sometimes practitioners may assume things to be, you know, this is historically when women have symptoms, they assume it's psychogenic. Yeah. It's true in their mind or they assume it's hormones. Nothing can be assumed to be hormones or psychogenic until it has thoroughly been investigated. We cannot assume that things are not from a biological or organic basis without something like a heart monitor or a stress test. And this is actually when we talk about the realm of women's heart health, and this is more on the arrhythmia, heart rhythm side of things, women are less likely to be investigated when they have these symptoms compared to a man because their symptoms are chalked up to, as you say, hormones, et cetera. Yeah. And I think you just have to be able to stress and advocate for yourself and get the necessary test done. And listen, you may end up in the same place, but at least you have ruled out everything else. And this yeah. is part of the reason why women may have decreased diagnosis because there's a delay or their symptoms may be attributed to something else when really it was from something that needed to be treated. For example, women can have atrial fibrillation more frequently and have a worse outcome from stroke. Mm -hmm. And this kind of has to do with the physiology of the heart of women, right? I mean, uh, certainly women may, may manifest many symptoms. Palpitations are what you feel. It is true of what you feel. A heart monitor will be recording your heart rhythm over periods and you will write down what you feel and then they correlate what you feel with the symptoms you're feeling. It's a very useful tool. Yeah. So, and also nausea and some, uh, and things, I mean, from the clinics, I'm sure you um, see a wide variety of women experiencing many different symptoms. So it's, it's kind of interesting for women, even in the call today to kind of know that they can, and you mentioned it during your talk that there can be different man manifestations of heart, heart attacks. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the other question was about breathlessness. Is that something to worry about in, in, in context of getting a cardiac check? breathlessness so women, that that is that is a symptom right so the person her name is noel barry Murs. she was at cedar sinai and she said anything above the waist that feels unusual or different to you there are different phases right so pre-screening when you are of a certain age you should get a baseline risk with a stress test or something like a calcium score for example as a baseline test with your cholesterols and your metabolic health and then if you get symptoms, particularly when you're moving around or active that are happening when you're active that go away when you're not, that could be concerning for something that's a heart event. Now, it can be because of weight gain and high blood pressure and things like that, but it is often women, older patients, people with diabetes, women of different ethnic uh, ethnicities can have symptoms of angina, which are not the Hollywood classic chest pain. They can be what we call anginal equivalents, and they do reflect narrowing in the heart arteries. And so it's very important if you have any symptoms to make sure that you get the care that you need and it's checked out to make sure that it's addressed and treated if needed. Okay. And earlier this week, we had a uh, talk about uh, premature menopause and people can watch it on our website. We'll post the link soon. But the question is, what are the cardiac impacts of early menopause in your 40s and what action should one take? This is a very good question. I think we do know uh, that people who have early menopause are at increased heart risk. The reason is that they just have these changes metabolically sooner than others. And as a result, these changes result in longer exposure to poor blood sugars, higher cholesterol, et cetera. So if you can mitigate that where possible, understanding that it requires exercise and activity and a good diet, but also medication, then that would help sort of counter some of these negative effects that can be happening because it's not so much the magnitude, but it's the time mm -hmm. that these changes are happening over. Um, and one of the things that we stress at Miara is good nutrition, good, um, you know, exercising a lot. But recently there have been a lot of um, 
uh, there's been some news about these fitness influencers who've actually got cardiac arrest. So not only in India, but like globally as well. So um, is that is that an issue that, you know, people who exercise a lot could also be, yeah. So like you're a, getting a call. printer is doing some crazy things. I have okay. No it's okay. fine. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was just wondering about cardiac arrest. It's, it's not that a fit person or, you know, someone who's like a fitness influencer cannot have a cardiac issue, right? Like, so I actually say that I don't have x-ray vision when people come into my office. <laughs> I can't tell what their arteries look like. There are triathletes who look extremely fit, who have blockages in their arteries and need quadruple bypasses. And equally, there are morbidly obese people You're that good. don't look particularly healthy, that have no coronary, the perfectly normal coronary arteries. And this speaks to the cholesterol aspect. Mm -hmm. The most important mediator of everything is your atherosclerotic risk. So how much cholesterol, how high is your cholesterol? When did it get high? And, and whether or not we can bend that curve, it's lifetime exposure to cholesterol. And so, as I said, most people, their diet, many people believe that their diet is the prime contributor. And they look at things like the vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, which is very common in the South Asian culture. And that's a great diet to have. However, it only contributes about 25%. And the large part of our cholesterol in our bloodstream is dictated by your genetics, how your liver handles cholesterol. And this is where new medications beyond simply the, uh, the statins are under significant research to see if we can help even better at these specific genetic targets that increase our risk over our lifetimes. And one of the interesting studies that you mentioned is early menarche can lead to an earlier cardiac event. So that's quite interesting. Is there any uh, more information you can give us in terms of, is it again this big metabolic change that happens in the body and then uh, less preparation for it? Yeah, I, I do think so. I think it's just, it's the changes and then you have early menarche, you're more likely to have menopause sooner. Mm -hmm. um, it was an association, right? So women in, um, it's the WISE study, women's ischemic study, uh, but it was an association. It is very interesting when you think about it, because we often, when we get to menopause, think in a menopause view, you don't realize that menopause is part of the transition over your life. Mm -hmm. So for yeah. sure. Yeah. And and one of the questions about HRT, and maybe you're not the expert, but I'll still ask this, what evidence is there, is, uh, is there for the safety and efficacy of HRT with respect to cardiovascular disease when HRT started more than 10 years after menopause? So it's actually a tricky answer to that. There actually is not, there's, there's actually danger and after. worse evidence mm -hmm. after 63, you know, so th that's why we're trying to look at younger women closer to menopause in the first 10 years, because we think that the risk will increase because of stroke, venothromboembolism, thromboembolism, breast endometrial cancer, et cetera. Obviously, it's an individual conversation to have with your specific cardiologist uh, or other practitioners. And that's why I think it's very interesting. Um, the American centers do have perimenopausal or menopausal prevention arms where they counsel around what is the best option for you? How can you? That said, it depends on what symptoms are driving people to need HRT. Mm -hmm. Because in the UK, for example, you can actually access um, topical genitourinary estrogens over the counter. Mm -hmm. And that is not systemically absorbed. So it should not have that adverse risk that we're talking about. So it, it is of relevance that there are HRT is not all the same. There are different kinds, there are different modes, and it's a conversation to have with a specific practitioner based on your specific risks. And I think that's very important to, to know because everybody has different risks and familial risk, genetic risk, autoimmune disease, as you mentioned. And I think it's really something, yeah, like you said, a conversation with your doctor. There's a very specific question about um, without HRT in menopause, what is the mechanistic action that drives lowering sex hormones to generally increase lipid profiles? 
If a woman chooses not to go on HRT but sees an increased lipid profile, especially LPA or ApoB, do you recommend statin drugs? <laughs> so statins are amazing medications. I recommend statins whenever they're indicated. You, Sanjana, as a biochemist are probably more versed to speak on this. There, there are tremendous mechanisms with the metabolic changes with withdrawal of estrogen and FSH and all these other types of changes that do cause the increase in lipids. And to be absolutely honest, with HRT, I do not think you are really significantly affecting the lipids predominantly. The purpose of HRT is to treat vasomotor symptoms, yeah. hot flashes, being yeah. uncomfortable, depression, anxiety, palpitations, what have you. Mm -hmm. We have excellent tools to treat lipids. And 100%, I would strongly recommend lipids because there is tremendous data on their benefit their safety, their efficacy. Now, women and their specific experience may have some that may, may have more reactions to lipid lowering therapy like statins. That's very well documented, and that is real to them. There's something called the nocebo effect, which means that when you're taking a medication and you've heard about negative effects from them, no. then you may experience side effects. But it should be clearly stated that they are the number one medications that can actually prevent significant heart disease over the course of your life, plaque rupture, meaning the bursting progression of heart disease, heart acute events. And they're good medications that are well tolerated with very few major effects when studied in very large clinical trials. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's good to know. So HRT is not, I mean, we've spoken to a multiple menopause specialists and they've said HRT is not to be taken as preventative, uh, as a preventative uh, measure for cardiac disease or uh, dementia or anything or bones. Um, so there, there was also a question about how does one know if you have pro-thrombotic risk? So it's interesting, prothrombotic is a term that simply means increased risk of blood clots. And that generally speaks to what we call venous thromboemboli, meaning on the venous side of things, the blood returning to the heart. Uh, that's the realm of hematologists. When we talk about prothrombotic though, in a cardiac realm, we mean when people have those cholesterol blockages we saw in the video that develop over a lifetime, and then they burst because of what we call plaque rupture. We're still not clear on why that happens in people, but it does. And if it happens in the heart, that's a heart attack. Prothrombotic simply means that when that artery ruptured, the plaque ruptures, the artery basically has something like a bruise on the inside. And if you have a bruise on the outside of your body, your body then tries to patch it up and you get platelet rich. Um, blood clots and you form a scar on the outside. That's great if it's on the outside of your body, but it happens on your inside of your heart on an artery and it blocks the artery, then the heart muscle doesn't have any blood flow. So that's what we mean by prothrombotic, that if an artery bursts, it blocks the flow of blood to the heart. And if it's not treated and the heart artery is not opened, that causes a cardiac arrest heart stopping among other things if it doesn't have enough oxygen mm -hmm. um yeah thanks for that another question was apart from cardiac ex cardiac exercises and keeping fit what can be done against non-somatic left ventricular insufficiency so i think we use different terms a little bit in canada but Left ventricular insufficiency means weakness of the heart muscle, the left ventricle. The most common cause of heart weakening of the left ventricle is a heart attack. Mm -hmm. It's from when you don't have oxygen to that segment of the heart muscle, it doesn't get revascularized, the artery doesn't open soon enough, leaving you with scar tissue. So the heart muscle generally, what we call the ejection fraction, how much is pumped out of what comes in is around 53% or more, but it will be decreased if there's a scar tissue and for your life. And we have medicines that can help, but it is scar tissue. No amount of surgery or anything can restore that. We have good medicines, which sometimes can help. If it stays very poor, then you need a defibrillator because you're at risk of a rhythm problem. 
Other common causes of weakness of the heart muscle or left ventricular insufficiency, uncontrolled blood pressure. And that's why it's very important to control your blood pressure. And uh, other medications, for example, chemotherapy agents for breast cancer or other medications or other kinds of cancers. Those are some of the common causes, but the most common is heart attack or blood pressure that's not controlled. Okay. So what can be done about that? It's just controlling the prevention. Control the risk factors so it does not happen to you okay. in the first place. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say that if anybody wants to unmute and ask their question, this is the time to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to ask maybe one last question and let the busy doctor get on with life. So if you have any question, um, yeah, you can unmute yourselves and ask. Okay, if not, I'm going to ask one, one more question. Uh, Post-menopause, is there anything extra that we can do to take care of the heart? Is there something, because you know you're already at a risk and you know, um, so what can you do? I think menopause is an opportunity, right? So there are these touch points in our lives where things happen and people are just primed to have information. It's a big physical change. Things are changing. You recognize that. I think it's never a bad time to just take stock of where you are metabolically with your risk factors at that particular time. So when we talked about the uh, American Heart Association's preventative risk factors, they actually term them life's essential eight, but they operationalize them as ideal, intermediate, or poor. And that is noted to be at different times in your lifetime, it can like life journey, it can change. So after you hit menopause, you can say, is my essential eight risk, ideal, intermediate, or poor? Where is the opportunity to change or improve what I have so that I can continue to have a good quality of life, so I can continue to be free of disease, so I continue to do the things that I enjoy doing that give my life meaning? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's 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 what we advocate for at Miara as well. So sure. So I think it starts with how you're feeling, right? So many women will go in to see their doctor and say, Can you check my hormones just on spec to just test how close I am to menopause? That's not very helpful. What is helpful is if you have had or are in the process of having perimenopausal type symptoms, or you have had 12 months where you have not had your period. And then you can simply go see your doctor and say, can you assess my risk, my heart risk? I'm interested in HRT. It's as simple as that. But you don't need to preemptively or prophylactically be asking for HRT because there's no benefit of doing it before it happens. But certainly, if you're having symptoms, it's a very reasonable conversation to say, I'm feeling this, and I'd like to know what the risk or benefit is of going on HRT for my symptoms, keeping in mind my heart. But I think if you are not currently having an event or symptoms or in menopause or perimenopause, it is never a bad time to see someone and say, I am interested in heart disease screening. It is never too early to start thinking about heart disease risk factors because these are things that will come to fruition later in life. And if we can address them and be in the best metabolic and risk factor health as early as possible, you may actually reduce your risk of having heart events in future. Yeah, that's, that's, that's important. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think we were ever told this by anyone. So thanks for that. That's really useful. So yeah, I think uh, that's a good point to kind of end. Um, thank you very much for your time again. And uh, we hope to have many more discussions like this, hopefully with you again and talking about different aspects of cardiac health. And uh, yeah, thanks for being a champion for women, uh, women's hearts and women's health.